Thank you, everyone. Um, one of the wonderful things of giving a talk on the last day is you have a lot of friends in the audience. So I appreciate each of you coming here to listen and to support me. Thank you. So this talk started about six months back when I joined VMware. And uh, my boss and my boss's boss said, hey, there's an IoT conference way down under. And that's your focus. How about you go there? And they gave me the opportunity. They encouraged me to come up with a talk. And here I am today. And thank you for being here. So Linux makes a lot of things possible. And that was one of the easiest parts in this project. And uh, I've been interested in automotives for the last two years when I was helping to build a data center for developing autonomous vehicles. And in that job in that role, I never really got to drive around in a car except for one test drive and we were thinking of funding somebody and, and it was a great experience. But I never had any hands on like, hey, what's the car doing? How fast is it going? You know, how's it turning? And things like that. And uh, that's why automotive IoT was something that was calling to me. So I have been in open source for about five years, worked on Xeon Power and Performance, cloud technologies, and worked on IoT before it was a sexy term. So that's more than 15 years ago. And in those days, flash drives were uh, rather small. So I tried to run Java on it. It was too fat and chubby. And I said, hey, I'm going to throw this package out, that jar out. That would have violated all the licenses. So luckily, they made a micro Java, and the flash got bigger. But today, IoT is, is so easy. Those Raspberry Pis, the Arduinos, Go, and Linux, and it just all fits together, and it sings and dances and hums and things like that. So it's mighty easy today. My collaborator is Alex, who's on my team, who's been interested in automobiles, I think, from 12, and must have got his license as soon as he could. So here we are. What's automotive IoT? Our solution, Linux, Python, Raspberry Pi. And we'll touch on IoT frameworks and why we might be interested in them and what we can do there. So I had a green card because I wanted to keep the you know Linux conf green team, but I didn't get quite the same shade of green. So let's look at some use cases and challenges in this space. You know, autonomous driving is a very big thing. But before that, what else can we do with the cars? You know, they're connected, they're not connected. What can you take out of them? What can you put on them? Things like that. So who would like to know how they're driving? How many times they had to brake? How many times they did a hard acceleration? Or were they speeding? Or you know, were they just kind of like idling in traffic and not getting anywhere? And that's a good stuff to collect. You know, say, boss, I really don't want to come into work every day. I'm wasting so much time commuting. I'll be more effective at home. Uh, of course, insurance companies are very interested in this sort of information, how we're driving. Fleet managers are very interested. You know, is their vehicle like optimum? Uh, is it using its fuel eff efficiently? Where are they going other than just where they're supposed to go? Are they maintaining the temperature of their goods right? Things like that. And in the US, there are companies like Verizon who already have an automotive solution. And you know, some of the specs that I've taken for like what's a hard break, I've taken from some of their documents. Preventative maintenance, and that's how uh, the sensors came about originally. So I got a nice picture. My friend, colleague, and boss, Darren, said, you know, if you just have text on the slides, they're not going to be fun. So I had a lot of fun at Flickr. So what is an IoT application anatomy look like? There's a lot of sensing from your sensors. You get a lot of data. You want to analyze it. You might want to transmit some of it. Maybe you just want to save some of it. And saving is something like if you're having cameras and you're in a remote location. You might not really want to transmit all of that. You might just want to keep it in a you know, storage. It can be pretty cheap then. You can even do some things like distributed learning. Now, you've sent some data, you've analyzed it, you might want to react to it. Hey, you know, do I want to beep beep and say, hey, lady, you're moving out of your lane, or you're speeding, or whatever. 
So today we're not going to look at the three things at the bottom. We're not looking at React. We're not looking at software updates, nor have I addressed the issue of registration. I've just kind of taken a look at the top two, sense and some data analysis. And we didn't get too far, but I'm very proud of this code. It came together, and I hope Matt and others who want to teach students in a low-cost, effective way, everyone doesn't need one of these devices, and they can borrow each other's cars or, you know, use their parents' car, and then get some data out of it. So the challenges. In a typical IoT application, there's a lot of heterogeneity at the device level. They speak different protocols. You know, MQTT is one of the more popular ones, but you have Bluetooth, you have Zigbee. It just goes on. So that's something that you will keep in mind when you're thinking frameworks. How can you enable a system more easily by supporting these different protocols? In the case of the automotive IoT space, there's intermittent connectivity. Not everybody wants to have their cell phone plan or something being used up the data plan just to chuck data over to some place. You know, definitely not for the insurance company, but even for our own hobby purposes, how am I driving type of stuff. So that's where the intermittent connectivity comes in. And even if you were ready to use up all your data plan, suppose you're in driving in between canyons, you're not going to have connectivity. Suppose you're under in a tunnel, you're not going to have connectivity. So that's a real problem in this space. Then there's limited edge capabilities. You're not going to have GPU units and things like that over there in edge devices. You want low latency, definitely security. And you might have to honor some data regulations. You know, our privacy matters. So we're going to look a little at heterogeneity today. We're going to look at a bit of data volume and intermittent connectivity, but not too much of the rest. So let's get to our solution. So, so we're going with Linux. We wanted to have a small form factor uh, in not too much compute, something that's affordable to see how far we could push this in. And the Raspberry Pi was plenty. So we went shopping. So I got the corporate card and said, oh, I want one Raspberry Pi. Uh, I want one for Alex. I need you know, an OBD connector. Luckily, that wasn't very expensive, only $15. Then we said, okay, we'll share the little display board. We don't need too many of them. You know, when you use it, I won't use it. We just set it up, configure. We needed a GPS device. Uh, so some of the challenges in this space is like if you're at office and you want to develop code and you're deep inside your office building, your GPS sensor won't do a thing. So you say, hey, you know, you've got to go in the garage. But the garage also won't work. And if you want some real data, you have to actually be driving the car, otherwise the OBD sensor says, hey, zero speed, nothing exciting happening here. So those were some of the challenges. And there's one parking spot very close to our office entrance. So we say, oh, get there early in the morning, park the car there so we can do some things when we have Wi-Fi connectivity, download stuff. And I say, uh, okay, never mind. We both will be there. We'll watch each other. I'll have my phone as a hotspot so we can you know, change code, do stuff. So those are some of the fun challenges in this space, and I think students will totally enjoy some of those things. So going further, let's talk a little about what is an OBD sensor, how does this stuff look inside the car. So there's an electrical control unit inside, there's a CAN bus, there's sensors, there are actuators, and a lot of this is used by the machine check devices inside, okay, I mean there's a lot of control and processing and observation going on. And that's the sort of stuff that happens when you go for taking your car for inspection. You know, your yearly or bi-yearly inspections, they start looking at the data that's been collected. You know, how's your fuel injector working? How are your brakes working? Things like that. And that rightmost bottom thing is where that OBD, the onboard diagnostic kit comes into play. So you just kind of plug it in, it's under your dashboard, fits in neatly, and it was introduced way back in 1980. And you know, it's become a standard, and more and more metrics are collected. Different car companies uh, uh, you know, provide you different metrics, different models across the years provide you different metrics. So there's some variety over there. And there are also other extensions. And of course, many of you must have attended the GPS talk yesterday, and it just gives you fine-grained time resolution. It gives you where you are, latitude, longitude, and altitude. And why is that interesting for us in the automotive space to know what the speed limits are? 
So how does our solution look? So we have at the, I'll get all my rights and left mixed up, so let me go this way. So over here you have the sensing in your car, and the actual code part is there's a read loop, chuk, 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 read every few seconds or microseconds or whatever you want. Um, then there's a little bit of rules engine, which really in our case is some Python code that says if then else. Uh, we have no React at this point other than let's save something locally because in case I lose power or something else happens, I just want to collect the data. It's really hard to go driving and collect all this, you know, when you're alone and things like that, especially when we bring back the data and test before our system is complete. Uh, we decided we didn't need to have any database over there. I mean, just the file system is plenty for our purposes. Collect this data, write it into a file so we can bring it back and look at it. Some domain knowledge is useful. What you know, speeding, what is hard acceleration, and, um, you know, those numbers, those thresholds are different depending on whether you're a light vehicle or a heavy vehicle, and of course, there's some configuration involved. Where should I transmit this data, which IP address and things like that. So in our case, we said, let's look at three applications, and that's why I said three birds with one Linux. We said, let's see what an insurance application might look like, what a smart city application might look like, and what my driving application might look like. I might want to know from where to where I drove, how much fuel I consumed, um, when I drove, and then how many speedings and da-da-da, all that fun stuff. But for smart city, I don't want to share with them who I am, which vehicle I'm driving, I don't want to share with them anything more than where I was stuck, you know, my GPS coordinates and what my speed was, whether I was accelerating, decelerating, things like that. Why is that useful? And it could also become like a crowdsource opportunity. If a lot of people are stuck in some particular area, that might be a bottleneck. Maybe they have to change those traffic light timings. Maybe they need to add another lane. This is like hard evidence that you can't ignore, okay? And then, um, maybe too many people are speeding in some place and that's close to a school or something else, that's information for them to say, hi, I need to put a speed breaker here. Or a camera. That does a lot, you know, just the warning. And, uh, you know, the insurance company would like a lot too. They might even like to know where exactly you're driving. Like if you're in an unsafe neighborhood, okay, I'm going to jack up your insurance rates or, you know, you're in some place, you don't really drive much, let me give you a senior discount or lazy discount kind of thing. So how does it look inside the car? Uh, under the dashboard is this OBD, so that's connected to our Raspberry Pi through Bluetooth. And uh, it's kind of amazing how far Bluetooth can go. So Alex, my colleague, is about two floors above his garage, the signal can go down two floors. So it's pretty far. I, I thought it was maybe you know, really close. It's, it's quite far. Um, excuse me, <laughs> bless you. Uh, the GPS connects through a U USB, and then the Raspberry Pi gets its power from the car. We didn't take the trouble of putting a battery, but that's something we could do. Um, and then if you could kind of manage, take from the car while you're connected and then, you know, have your battery so you can bring it back into office or home and then have things uploaded on your Wi-Fi. And then eventually a cloud point, uh, you know, from where you could use a browser on your phone, anywhere to look at this data that you've collected. And you can host your own, so that's kind of a nice project for students. They can run it all on one laptop. You know, here's my edge, that's, you know, you take your laptop into the car, collect it, or whatever, you don't really need even the pie at this point. So um, the day I asked Alex to take pictures, he said, oh, I didn't vacuum my car. So here's his <laughs> GPS right on the dashboard. Under the dashboard is his OBD, and there's our pie. And uh, you know, this is just a little display of uh, how our UI looks. This is a very simple one. I said, for my driving, let me just for this practical purpose, save the distance we drove, the fuel consumed, that's, the fuel's just coming off the OBDs, you can do a subtraction over there. And then, uh, you know, this is how the data comes off. This, this green piece is actually capturing the data before we put in the GPS, and then the one below is GPS goes on too far out into the page, so I said, never mind. It collects a lot of stuff. And uh, let's now talk a little about frameworks. 
Why are we interested in frameworks? Well, because they give us a lot of structure. They give us a lot of stuff for free. And I'm going to take, oops. Sorry. I'm going to. It was one of us. I'm going to just take this out of this escape. If I can find the escape button now. End show. Hang on. I'm going to take you here into my browser briefly. And uh, so this is a sample application. VMware has. Oh, I don't want to do that. How do I change that? Little technical difficulties. Does it come? Yes. Okay. So uh, this code that we developed, all Python, we have uploaded into a sample location at VMware, and uh, we'd be very happy if people take a look, use it. But Okay, and uh, so it's VMware samples. It's really a sample. And I'll tell you right up front that I wish there was more documentation. I wish there was more test cases. I wish we had handled all those other things like security. Uh, <laughs> thing. So uh, before going further, I'd like to click on this and say, hey, you know, it's a teaching vehicle. Pun fully intended. So I said, hello, professor, students, this is a sample application, da, 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 what can we do here? How can we extend this? And this harks back to my days when I was studying compilers. Uh, so our professor had given us a little framework, some stuff code, and go say, go do your LALR parsing or your something else, write a symbol table, some lexical analysis and then even right up to code generation and optimization. So it was really, really good that he gave us this framework and we could just go focus on these things. And in that sense, in that mode, I offer this code, that this can be something that we can all build upon. And the reason why I got started on this and you know why Alex and I built this was, here we wanted to, we're part of the Open Source Technology Center and we wanna make things easier for others by contributing something of value to open source. But how do you know what to contribute? What is a useful feature? It only comes when you get your hands dirty, when you're trying to build something and say, geez, that wasn't easy. Or, hey, if I did this, somebody else doesn't have to do it. And when I was working on cloud technologies and I was at Intel working on Xeon servers, I never launched a cloud. And sometimes a feature that's so trivial that your you know, employer might not think is important is very, very important to the admin. Okay, so I said this time around, let me change things a little. Let me build an IoT application and see where my pain points were so I can upstream code that solves those problems. And in this automotive space, I was like, okay, I'm looking at those frameworks. Hello there. There's nothing that takes in GPS data. I didn't find one. Uh, I didn't find something that handled the OBD data. There's, you know, Python code somewhere, awesome, open source. You can, you know, load that package but there wasn't something in an IoT framework. And, and this was early on, like six months back when I was just joining VMware and I said, okay, I still don't even know all the open source projects out there and there's so much out there. Let me get my own feel. Let me get a sense of this water temperature here. So in that sense, we started this and we said, okay, none of the frameworks I have seen at that point had handled intermittent connectivity. How might I do it? I might just put a little for loop and say, hey, can I reach the Google server or this you know, CNN news site? That means I have connectivity, and then let me upload all my data that I've saved type of stuff. Simple things like that. Maybe we can get fans here over there. Um, I never set up HTTPS, and you know, that's a very important thing when you register a device, like you know, who do I trust, what do I collect data from, otherwise you can have a denial of service attack type of stuff. So I said, let's just get HTTP going and then let's handle more, okay? So in that sense, when you look at this code, you say, hey, you know, you can add more test cases. We just did a little curl command, can I reach the server type of stuff, and you know, there's a lot of print statements out there, if debug type of stuff. 
And then uh, one of the things, as I mentioned, you know, when you're in this development world before you got your OBD or reading and, you know, writing and stuff like that, we therefore had to have a live mode and a recorded mode. So, you know, we could collect the data and then come back into office and then develop some domain knowledge in there. So the configuration variables are say, hey, work in live mode, work in recorded mode, work in always upstream mode type of stuff. So then another thing that we said is, hey, what are the security things? And, and this week was just awesome because there were several security talks. It's like, let's do HTTPS. Let's see how you might protect from denial of service. Could you use some kind of API token? And then if you have API tokens, your server has to say, which are the legitimate tokens, which ones you might revoke and say, hey, that's a revoked token. Don't listen to this entity anymore. And then that token itself is a proxy for your identity. So how would you handle it in a smart city kind of application where you might not want to send us API token, but still not have a denial of service attack? Then what about firewalls? So this can be, you know, Rusty gave a talk, IP tables, how might you use it? And so this is a good exercise for students too. Then what about Bluetooth security? And it was a real surprise that, you know, it goes up like 30 feet away. So that's a good distance. Then um, validate your input data anywhere where you're doing posts. You have to check, are they giving you integer where you're expecting it, string, is it too long, is it too short? Are they trying to do some kind of SQL injection? So this can become a pedagogical tool for us to teach the next generations too. How can I reduce the attack surface? So the way we had our application uh, from the vehicles, we're sending up data into this cloud endpoint or data center or your own laptop endpoint, that's a put. But just support that one API. Don't put in that code all sorts of other things that people can then kind of misuse, guess, and say, you know, let me do more damage. Just keep that attack surface really small. And then what about the software you're using? Does it have any vulnerability? So we're gonna get the students to look like, hey, you know, there's this buffer overflow something. Should I change the code? Should I, oh, no code is there to you, you know, deal with it? Should I upstream a patch for it sort of thing? We thought of a bunch of security things we can do. What about user interface? We wrote this little thing in Python. Do you want to port it to run on your Apple phone, your Android phone? Do you want to make the UI more interesting, some colors, some style sheets, whatever? And then uh, more about the automotive domain itself. Like I kept the MyDrive application very simple. Like how, how much did I drive? How's my fuel use? But we can get stats, we can have a graph to say, you know, where are all those slow points, at what time of the day do these happen? So there's a lot of stuff that we could do here. And so on and so forth. People can upload data and this will become part of like an open data initiative where we can use this, analyze this, develop different things. Okay, and now I go back here and say, let's continue the presentation. Wrong current slide. So I just gave you a sense of the sort of things we could do. And like I mentioned about security, about API keys, about um, better unit tests and you know how we can break this sort of unit test. And I think in the IoT space, that's very important because those devices will be different. How do we even set up test cases for different form factors where you're running it and testing it? So this is where frameworks are valuable. And if we can, enrich a framework, we can all get the benefits of it. So the frameworks I was looking at with my team was the EdgeX Foundry initiative. It was started by Dell and it's got a community around it. Their main value, I think, I mean, it's my personal opinion, is that they support multiple protocols. They have support for a rules engine, so you can make your uh, domain knowledge kind of declarative out there. And this export piece, what's export is all about sending it to some cloud endpoint. Then I came across Belina Engine, which is an open source uh, engine for like Docker containers. Why Docker containers? That's one of the things in our sample code. We made all the web applications all Dockerized so you can upgrade them and things much easier to canary kind of testing. But we also want to make the uh, code that runs on the device a Docker container. So then what do you need there from the security angle? You want maybe all the configuration detail of where you send this data to be um, 
non-modifiable? Should you use only read-only volumes over there? Then you need some write and read stuff where you want to save the data in your local file system. So it makes our, you know, I learned a little more about containers in the process, and there's another security angle there. Who provided this container? Is it a legitimate container? Who signed it? And can you check it out somewhere type of stuff? So we have another project at VMware called Turn, where we're doing the whole provenance of a container from each layer of its file system to give us that level of security and confidence in what we download. Then I came across the Cube Edge initiative. It's relatively new. And what they want to do there is leverage the whole Kubernetes ecosystem of you know, being able to download stuff, have it containerized, use the other resources over there so you can see how the traffic is going. So there are other projects called Istio and Envoy. So they want to leverage all the framework tools capabilities from those communities. So there are a couple of different ones that I'm interested in. The way they're looking to me right now is they can uh, you know, like complement each other. And, it's, and the Bellina engine is all about a very lightweight uh, engine, container engine for these small form factors so that you know, your, your container footprint is smaller. And another thing that they bring to bear is sending you software updates that are just deltas. Like in the old days, you could say, hey, I'm going to give you a whole VM image, or I'm going to just say file one, two, three, four chain. So just put that in its place and run, especially if it's something like Python that's you know interpreted type of stuff. You don't even have to send a whole jar file or a .so file. So uh, that's the value. And you know, as this project proceeds, and I get in, into more of these frameworks and contributing my learnings upstream, I see us using some of these different technologies. So uh, I'm going to give you a little closer peek at the EdgeX Foundry. Uh, it's an Apache 2.0 uh, license. It's part of the Linux Foundation. They have some core components, and their first version was all Java, so it was a little chubby. Its uh, second version is all Go, so they're at their 0.7 release right now. And it's much, much sm smaller. So if you were to like Google them, you'll find how, how much they've shrunk, which in this case is good. Uh, they have a couple of startups who are also part of the team now. There's IOTech, Mainflux, and Intel. They have uh, an edge gateway. Dell has an edge gateway. And you, know, you and I and all are looking at Raspberry Pis this last week. So the solution fits on all of them. They're also thinking of, of course, getting uh, you know, compliance and testing and certification to give more consumer confidence for larger types of applications. And you see at that bottom over there, these are the protocols they are supporting today. And right now, we don't have our USB in there, and we don't have our uh, you know, OBD device there. So that's some of the things we're going to upstream. And, uh, my team and I, we are going to be changing some of the things about how they assume about connectivity from our automotive experience, this intermittent connectivity and handling it. And then all applications don't need you know, a MongoDB or you know, a Postgres or whatever database. There's, it just really depends on the application. One size does not fit all. So we're introducing in EdgeX a data abstraction layer, and you can choose which way you want to go. And I mentioned to you the rules engine. The current version is in Java Chubby. So where uh, my team is looking at you know, replacing it with some Go solution that meets the needs. So I kind of already told you what those next steps are. Uh, sensors are not always going to be push. You know, I'm sending you GPS data. Do you want it? It's up to you. Read it type of stuff. Sometimes you have to pull it, like the OBD sensor. Uh, then uh, I already mentioned the rules engine, intermittent connectivity, and then we want to explore how we might use Cube Edge to leverage the Kubernetes tools to say, hey, you know, all you devices out there, all you Edge devices, you belong to. Uh, in Kubernetes, you can define these uh, these groups, aggregates or whatever you call them, and say, hey, all you Edge aggregates for automotive, uh, there's a new container out there. Go up update yourselves, or there was this vulnerability and you need to update your operating system type of stuff. So we want to look at those sort of things. 
Uh, a bunch of references, uh, you know, some from VMware on their edge solutions, their IoT ideas, you know, some on data regulation that I want to read more about. Uh, then our shopping cart, all the stuff we bought. Uh, I'm sure, I hope you find them at a cheaper price. A little bit about OBD, GPS, you know, we could create our own preventative application. Uh, I got the spelling wrong, I'm sorry. And um, some domain knowledge, oops. I didn't want it to repeat, never mind. All left, two left fingers, thumbs, etc. Our source code, um, so it was like a last minute rush. I just don't know how Rusty had expected people to bring all their tutorials and slides two weeks before some of this code push was happening last night. Uh, so. <laughs> So we'd really love you to explore this, extend it, and enjoy it. And uh, thank you so much to everyone. I mean, the richness and robustness of Linux made this so easy in this day and age. It was very different 15 years ago. And, um, and of course, the size of the flash and everything else, and then there was no go. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'm open to any questions now. Framing my question in the form of a question, I'm going to keep talking until the audio starts. Uh, we can do it like Jeopardy, if you no, can ask totally... a question and the answer. In the form of a question, are you going to make your GitHub repository that is currently private? I know. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so I was say we are pushing things yesterday, last minute, and it's definitely going to be public. It'll maintain that URL. Uh, it took about two weeks to get approval on the name, you know. To, uh, I had like, I called it auto IOT 101 or something. And there were objections, you know, you can't have camel case like that. And how about you make it automotive and auto is, it? never mind. So that was that. Then yesterday it was like, yes, it's all there. But there's a, another button over there saying approve. So did you put your license file? Did you put your Git ignore? So we're there, close. Uh, but at least I had it over here to click through the web link. So I was happy about that. Um, hello. Um, the all of this, all of this OBD stuff. So, are there like standard units one buys to put in a car, or do you have to go to each manufacturer? Like, oh no, what's no, the... they're standard. It's from 1980s. All the pins, everything's very, very standard. But, but this is something a consumer can buy. You don't need to be a dealer or a mechanic to. Absolutely not. I just ordered it off of Amazon, fifteen dollars. And that little blue picture that I shared on one of those pages, that's how they look. They're multiple brands. Now, there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of interestingness over there that I mentioned. Uh, your car from different manufacturers will pull out different metrics, and your car from 1980, 1990, 2018, whatever, they'll collect different metrics. So that's another student project. When you put this in and then you say, hey, I want you to get A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, they should do it in a loop, check which one's there on this car, and then save that to a list. And then, um, you know, uh, in that for loop or that timeless loop that you have, you only get the ones that you have support for in that vehicle. Yes, Doug? To, to look at the OBD stuff? No, it's illegal to void your time. Oh, you have a good country then. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So um, in the US, as you know, ODB2 is required on any internal combustion engine car. Uh, sadly, electric cars are apparently exempt. Um, so to give you a good excuse to expand for Tesla, uh, on the ODB2, on the Tesla, you actually get nothing. It just gives you power and nothing else and you have to go to a different place to get any data at all. Um, so now you have a reason to get a, a work Tesla. But that, that, that said, uh, on the Model 3, there is no dashboard with, because there's nothing behind the steering wheel, huh. and it would be a great place to put a, a tablet and all the missing data that isn't there. I already have the tablet, I just don't have the thing that gets the data that's not there yet. But that would be awesome to add. Yeah. And now you can buy a Model 3 with your work credit card.
<laughs> my budget is much lower. <laughs> Um, does your application have any super? Does you envision having any supervision function over the engine management system? Uh, no, no, no. In this toy application, we didn't do any management of the engine, and uh, I think uh, like walk, crawl, run. I mean, crawl, walk, run type of thing. Um, make sure that you're not sending any commands on that OBD and don't allow it. I mean, that's very important security. You don't want somebody to put brakes or accelerate when you in that mode. Yeah. So it's good so far. Yeah. <laughs> um, those couple of last questions dovetail neatly into mine, which was um, what kind of things could potentially be controlled by a, a plugged in device and do you have any plans in the in that direction? Um, I have to investigate more uh, on that, but I was thinking in a very safe way, because this is still very learning, is like, why don't we stick a little light or some speaker kind of thing on our uh, Raspberry Pi and say, hey, you're crossing the lane or some car's close or something, that when we integrate a camera into it type of stuff. But I wasn't thinking of getting into the car specifically and doing any mischief there. Then really all, your insurance is void, your license is void, your car uh, warranty is void, it's, it's going to be crazy. So I didn't want to go that path. Any other questions? Um, what my question relates to um, engine ignition mapping. Would, does the... Um, having a higher level of um, supervision over the engine management system allow you to do better data diagnosis to provide more finite grained engine ignition mapping? And do you see that as an advantage at I, all? I, I see there is possibilities along those lines because I was looking at some of this reference material on OBD. Um, apparently there's something that measures the oxygen and things like that. If that uh, sensor is worn out, dirty, blocked, it gives you false readings. It's not sensitive enough, so you might not be running at optimum things. So there's scope for us to tinker around in true do-it-yourself mode and say, hey, I can make my car run better. So I could see some of those. And another thing is it could even just highlight to us like, hey, I mean, you're just stalling and wasting fuel. Like, can you turn off your engine, please? So. I think it might make us better, cleaner drivers too afterwards. <laughs> Could you use this tool to help teach people to drive? I mean, uh, Definitely. detect when you're about to kangaroo hop and say, push that accelerator down. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I can see it. And, um, I, you know, LIDARs, I think, will come down in price, too. So uh, that, uh, there are many things that we can do in that space of, of earlier warning for people before you have the fully autonomous car. We can use something like this to give people information and make them. And another thing is, like, we could even have, like, a little sensor in this that's listening to the chatter and the car and say, hey, teenagers, stop getting distracted here. <laughs> So my oldest son, you know, he wasn't a teenager when he's got a license. It was one of those birds that was hard to push out of the nest in this driving space. So I was like, you got to get a license, kiddo. We can't like drive you 45 minutes and wait for two hours and during your soccer practice type of thing. But he gets his license. He's driving in very close to home in San Jose, but he's with his friend and he gets a $350 ticket. He was speeding close to home. So, you know, it's nice to like tell these young drivers like, hey, you know, I can hear some chatter here, stop. So things like that is valuable. <laughs> um, another very interesting thing is here we are at this point in this automotive IoT space and we're thinking how to make better drivers and how to improve our driving experience. But maybe very soon this will become like, you know, the birds like don't fly, we humans might stop wanting to drive and we'll have all these autonomous vehicles, who knows. Maybe 20, 50, who knows, whatever. But yeah, for today, this is interesting. It's good to make our young drivers better drivers. 
Anyone else? And thank you for asking for the URL. I'm so excited. That means you're interested in visiting it, and it's going to become as public as possible very soon. Thank you. Thank you so Round of applause, much. everyone.